really excited to introduce this video's sponsor, Opera GX. What is Opera GX? It's the world's first browser for gamers, completely tailor-made for the gaming community. Opera GX offers features that any gamer would enjoy, such as GX Control, which allows you to limit the network bandwidth and or CPU slash RAM your browser is using. And let's be honest, that's a super common issue on most internet browsers that PC gamers are probably happy to hear a solution about. Coming into the 21st century, we have integration features already built into the Opera GX browser. No extra apps needed. Same goes for blocking ads, trackers, and more utility built into Opera GX itself. Opera GX is also fully customizable, allowing you to change the theme and even hook up your Razer stuff if you have Razer Chroma, like I do. Just click the top right corner here, and boom, new layouts. If you're worried about changing your internet browser over like I was, with all your bookmarks, cookies, and browser history, well fear not. GX has an import tool that allows you to import all of these quickly and painlessly. Opera GX isn't just on PC either. It has a mobile client as well that you can download on any major app store. The best part? Well, it's free. You can download Opera GX for free at opera.com GX, or check the download link in the description or the pinned comment as well. I'd like to say thank you again to Opera GX for sponsoring this video. Now back to the video, detectives. It's not very often you hear the words pioneer uttered in any art context. The word carrying with it a certain weight and reverence, and oftentimes, too, the heavy price of being first. In an attempt to catch up with the West and their online gaming pioneers such as Ultima Online, EverQuest, and Diablo, Sega with the Sonic Team developers would attempt an online RPG of their own, dubbed Fantasy Star Online. Officially the first online RPG featured on a console, and from Japan in general. A title, I might add, all other Sega developer teams had rejected originally. Launching on Sega's very own Dreamcast console first, as it featured a revolutionary modem for the time, Fantasy Star Online was set to compete with the Western Titans in online gaming, and that it did as it not only dominated the local Japanese market, but reached global successes and influence that has been undeniable since then, even going on to pioneer its very own subgenre, online RPGs, or MORPGs as I have been calling them. Spanning the launch and porting of multiple console launches including a PC launch, multiple versions, and even a card game spinoff, Fantasy Star Online's history as a title was both one of the most interesting and impactful in the online RPG space. Without Fantasy Star Online, or PSO for short, there wouldn't be Monster Hunter, Final Fantasy XI, or even Final Fantasy XIV, or perhaps many more titles spawned from its wake and influence. Who would have thought mixing an ARPG with a JRPG would have the effect that PSO did? PSO would last for nearly a decade on official servers, and was ultimately not shut down due to some failure, or the game not being up to snuff really. PSO was a commercial, artistic, and even philosophical and ideological success. This episode is less about solving a case, less about talking about the failures of PSO, and more about detailing the story behind one of my favorite, most impactful titles ever. No, this death of a game is more of a journey down nostalgia lane for people like myself, and taking a look back on classic online gaming history. On this episode of Death of a Game, we will chronicle in short two decades worth of online JRPG history concerning Fantasy Star Online, highlighting the most important and impactful bits along the way, before ending the video with the usual case breakdown detailing the largest contributing factors to the game's death. Pick your class detectives, team up with some friends, and let's get to looting with this online JRPG that captured mine and many others' childhood. Sega, a globally known Japanese video game developer, had a history spanning 40 years of arcade games including the historical, world famous, and most relevant for this video, Sonic. Sega would announce a new revolutionary title for their premier console, Dreamcast, that had launched just one year earlier in 1998. Fantasy Star Online Showcase at the Tokyo Game Show in 1999. What would set PSO apart was it would utilize the not really so far leveraged modem on the Dreamcast. This would allow Sega to bring their players into the next century, the online world, a feat never before done on consoles thus far. This was something Sega chairman Asao Okawa was keen on. Okawa was single-handedly responsible for keeping Sega alive through funding and his seat on the board, considered a bona fide legend within the company. Okawa believed due to the rising popularity of online gaming on personal computers, there was a chance to capitalize on such for the Japanese market. The only issue was the market wasn't a PC-centric one. In fact, online gaming and RPGs in Japan were almost non-existent. 
Consoles instead were insanely more popular, with Sega's Dreamcast, Nintendo's Nintendo and Super Nintendo, and Sony PlayStation, all based in Japan. Okawa had presented the idea to a number of Japanese developers, including primarily Sega in-house developers, and all of them had rejected the idea and proposition. Okawa was insistent, though. He still believed in the potential of taking a JRPG online for the Dreamcast console as a way forward for Sega Dreamcast and Sega as a whole. Okawa had declared internally 2000 would be the year of the network game, and was doing everything in his power to make sure that that dream could come true. In order to do this, Okawa still needed a team of talented developers to head the venture. Okawa wasn't going to take a no for an answer this time either. Okawa set his sights on the Sonic team, and specifically, the lead programmer of Sonic itself, Yuji Naka. Yuji Naka had admitted that everybody else was hoping somebody else would do it, but believed in Okawa's clear vision of the future. Akawa didn't just have a vision, though. He was willing to prove his convictions by funding a bundle of free internet access to come with PSO as a title in Japan. This was unheard of. Akawa was effectively paying people's internet access for a year to play the game on Dreamcast. Following the completion of Sonic Adventure in 1999, part of the original Sonic Team devs were now full steam ahead on creating an online title, but the team was mostly segmented. Naka, alongside game producer Takao Miyoshi, would team up with another Sonic Team alumni and the very character designer behind Sonic himself, Satoshi Sakai. Yuji Miyoshi and Satoshi were now met with a challenge. They had to make an online game without any local market examples or experience to lean on. The only thing they had to rely on that was proven was the Fantasy Star IP. Fantasy Star was a series of single-player RPGs that started on the Master System back in the late 80s, but most of the original staff that worked on PS had left by the time Fantasy Star Online production went underway. Thus, PSO is ultimately a series reboot. This meant they had to pay attention to what was happening in the Western market instead, specifically with the online gaming on PCs hitting all-time highs in 1999 with the rise and creation of the MMORPG market. The Sonic team would study three titles in particular in their preparation for designing an online title of their own, Ultima Online, EverQuest, and Diablo. While Yuji was a big fan of UO and EverQuest, which were MMORPGs, he admitted in a Dreamcast magazine interview he steered away from being an MMORPG because he thought such a game would be very difficult to pull off on consoles, due to their limitations with hard disk writing needed to store data. They simply didn't have a hard disk drive needed to support continuous online updates a problem he thought was not realistic to solve in just two years of development. Instead, Yuji would lean more towards a Diablo style, which was not an MMORPG, but instead an action RPG that had online capabilities. Yuji was impressed by Diablo, and although it was a 2D project, saw potential for Fantasy Star Online to learn from it, which would be featuring a 3D perspective and played on the Dreamcast instead of the PC. Yuji Naka made it a point to distinguish PSO as a different game and genre altogether with Ultima Online and EverQuest comparisons early on, stating that with PSO, the connections would be more with multiple clients creating multiple servers and worlds, hence the term they were using, Network RPG versus MMORPG. PSO effectively created the original idea of ORPGs or MORPGs. You would as the player spawn on Pioneer 2, the spaceship, and from there group up and create a lobby, shop, trade, or pick up quests located on the station. Early on the spaceship was more of a location that you would initiate grouping and menus from, but over time evolved more and more into what we would now call modern times a hub world or zone, leading to player socialization and exposure. You could cycle through programmed text options that were translated to and from different languages, allowing you to play PSO with theoretically anyone globally, breaking never-before-seen cultural and language barriers. The system had about 2,000 words near the end of development and had support built for five different languages, including Japanese, English, Spanish, German, and French. Italian and Portuguese had been considered but cut due to time constraints. Notice how Korean isn't one of the languages listed? Interesting, right guys? Well, there's a boatload of history between these two nations, but simply put, the markets are fundamentally different. That's because Korea was a PC market. There was a difference. Once on the Pioneer 2 station in PSO, you would try to find three other teammates to group up and complete the story and gameplay experience. After teaming up, the four of you would battle it out together over a variety of instant zones, navigate and defeat, and then loot the monsters located there. PSO had no PvP early on due to not wanting to take away from the cooperative experience present in the game, which mimics Diablo generally more than EQ or UO, which was less PvP-centric in general. 
The primary focus of PSO was cooperatively doing battle to monsters, looting, and rinsing and repeat that until you get better stuff, kill harder things, and then completed the story. All the while leveling up through 50 different levels. You did this through choosing one of the three classes in the game, and race combinations to go with. Hunter, specializing in melee weapons such as the saber, sword, dagger, katana, claw, or dual swords, whereas the ranger specialized in ranged weapons such as the handgun, rifle, mech guns, or even launchers. Finally, the force class, which utilized primary spells, or techniques as they were called in PSO, or a cane weapon, wand, or rod. Each of these weapons had three different attack buttons to sequence them, and varying levels and degrees of rarity and power as typical in an ARPG looter. Of the races to choose from, you had the typical human race, which were allowed to be all three of the classes and offered a more generalistic and balanced playstyle approach. Meanwhile, the Newmans are an evolved human race created for research purposes, less physically capable, but focus more on techniques, save for the female hunter class. Finally, the cast race, aka Robo Samurai people, are the android race and can be any of the classes listed. They're just more so geared towards being defensive rounded characters overall. They're also like literally the coolest thing ever to my 10 year old self, by the way. As the very first online console RPG, in order to even get PSO to work online, it was going to take serious effort. Utilizing a previously unreleased game and burning rangers as their foundation, as it was supposed to be a 4 player online game for the Saturn console, the Sonic team would then take the networking system from an action puzzle game of theirs, Choo Choo Rocket, as a template. The Sonic team had very little time to do their development, and needed to know quite quickly if their new networking online system would function successfully globally. Sonic Team wanted to do a global test, but ultimately was unable to due to time restrictions. Instead, they would do a local test handed out to 10,000 different players who had already reserved their copy for the Dreamcast via an online direct sales service. It was reported that 90% of the users had been able to play the game online, resulting in a resounding success for the team. This gave the team confidence in their product going forward. Ultimately, the focus for PSO was success in the Japanese market first. Anything past that was seen as bonus successes. Naka had his sights set on cracking a million copies, 500,000 in the Japanese market alone. So expectations were high whether focused on Japanese success first or not. Meanwhile, nearly at the same time, Final Fantasy XI was being developed by Square Enix with Sony to be featured on the PC and eventually the PlayStation 1. So the Sonic team was going to need to be quick to beat into the market. Fantasy Star Online was originally set to launch in March of 2000, but was ultimately delayed due to trying to squeeze in more features. So much of the game's development and launch were rushed. It's really impressive things turned out like they did. Launch details would finally hit the web September 26, 2000, where it would be announced that PSO would be launching in Japan December 21, 2000, with a US launch date set to follow in January. Originally, PSO was supposed to be a simultaneous global launch in both Japan and the US, but chose to delay the US launch a month because they wanted to do a bit more beta testing. GameSpot would detail PSO's server system and how it would be capable of 20 network servers able to accommodate as many as 20,000 users online simultaneously, with the ability to add more, which they would do a few months later to 36,000 players. Insanely impressive for a game in the year 2000. Up to this point, the monetization model in America was in question. As in Japan, internet was charged by the minute, thus it eventually would have to offer fees to recoup their losses despite Okawa giving Japanese players a free year. IGN announced that Sega would be confirming an online free play model in America for PSO. America had broadband internet available, and for a flat monthly fee. Japan's launch, unfortunately, on the other hand, was still having to deal with a fee ultimately equaling out to about $10. Developed in only two years and set to revolutionize the very gaming world itself, Fantasy Star Online would launch in Japan December 21st, 2000, selling over 70,000 copies in just a week. PSO was doing quite well in Japan, but yet more success was on the horizon with a US and EU launch also yet to come. America would first see the 1.0 original launch of the game in January, and follow this launch with a 2.0 launch later in the fall. The 2.0 update for Fantasy Star Online would add 150 new levels, an ultimate difficult setting, a new challenge dungeon, and a PvP battle mode introducing PvP for the first time. Fantasy Star Online 1.0 would launch on Dreamcast January 29th, 2001 to critical acclaim, scoring an 89 out of 100 on Metacritic from 21 different critics. 
The 2.0 version, capitalizing on the success, would then launch September 24th, 2001, culminating in, as you guessed it, yet more success for the JRPG franchise. Naka in an interview with GameSpot in February would state that PSO, a networked ARPG as he was dubbing it, was reaching great success in Japan, reaching 130,000 sold copies. According to IGN, PSO would sell 70,000 copies in America, and 35,000 copies in Europe, bringing the overall count to 235,000 copies sold. Quite impressive for 2001. In fact, PSO was so successful, it had a black market where you could buy items, accounts, and currencies with real-life cash much like the ever-popular Ultima Online, who basically created the phenomenon in the first place. Following a bout of silence from the Sonic team, Yuji would break this silence to reveal new details concerning PSO and the future of the title. First, the name Fantasy Star Online would be changing. The title would now be called PSO Episode 1 and 2 in Japan, where it would be set to launch later in 2002 on the iconic Nintendo GameCube. With the name change, which supposedly referenced and featured the inclusion of the game's first major update, version 2.0, while Episode 2 was the new and original part of the content. The new content would feature two new worlds to visit, as well as a new storyline to boot, as well as three new characters would be introduced to the game. But quality of life changes and features would also be included, such as a tweaked interface, four-player split-screen co-op, and more. Fantasy Star Online Episode 1 and 2 would launch in Japan September 2002 on GameCube, being treated like a true sequel according to Yuji Naka, before following that with a launch in America, October 29th, 2002. Fantasy Star Online Episode 1 and 2 on the GameCube would score an impressive 85 out of 100 from 31 different critics. Gamesply, rest in peace by the way, simply said that the Sonic team as a team couldn't do any wrong, and Fantasy Star Online Episode 1 and 2 was more proof of that. IGN let those who had already played PSO know it was still worth the purchase again, for the GameCube stating that a whole new world and different experiences shined through for the title. PSO's simple gameplay formula, fit into an incredibly complex network system, and supported with consistent updates and innovation, was a recipe for more success for the Sonic team. PSO might not be an MMO, but it wasn't shying away from trying to continue to update and improve the game despite the difficulty of doing such on a console. Yuji Naka was dedicated to doing this. The Sonic team wasn't stopping with a successful GameCube launch for the PSO franchise. They would bring their successful online JRPG to the Microsoft Xbox console as well. Teased sometime in January of 2003, PSO would launch on Xbox Live with a reduced original price of $40 and include 60 days of playtime. If you wanted to keep playing the game, you had to pay a $9 monthly fee on top of the Xbox Live fee. This wasn't the case in Japan, but Microsoft would opt to not remove this for the North American version, which was set to launch in the spring of 2003 following the launch in Japan. Thank you, Microsoft, by the way. This was the same version that had launched on GameCube, save for the newly added, thanks to the Xbox Live features, voice chat services. This marks my entering of the story, as the Xbox version of PSO was the first version I ever played and fell in love with. The pricing model kept me from only playing it sparingly online, unfortunately, however. Before PSO and the Sonic team would launch their Xbox version in a totally bizarre and unexpected move, they would announce another PSO title set to launch also on the GameCube later in the same year. This one would be dubbed PSO Episode 3, Card Revolution, and as the name implied, was a card-based action combat game where you could compete against the AI or actual players and engage in turn-based card games. Fantasy Star Online Episode 3, Card Revolution, was like Final Fantasy's Tetra Master but like in 3D turned into an online game. It's actually a great idea that many other developers would attempt in different ways, whether through the use of cards or figurines. In fact, we covered one of these on the series, called Duelist. The reason the Sonic team even attempted such a game was due to the overwhelming popularity of the card game sets at the time. Two in particular that actually hailed from Japan, Pokemon from developer Game Freak and publisher Nintendo, and of course the card game with a manga and TV anime series of its own, Yu-Gi-Oh! By the spring of 2003, PSO had already been out for three years and was starting to look a little dated on the powerful Xbox console, especially compared to titles like Halo and Fable. The slightly lower score on Metacritic I think reflects this, with an 83 out of 100. IGN was disappointed in the Xbox version, as they stated it was basically a six month later than the GameCube launch with no specific Xbox utilizations besides the voice chat. All of this with another box price game and increased fees on top of it. Still. Fantasy Star Online on Xbox introduced many fans who had missed the original versions to a worldwide successful online JRPG.
PSO was my first MORPG or ORPG experience, and would lead to me finding refuge in Guild Wars 1 shortly after. Xbox allowing voice chat and connectable mini keyboards gave me the ability to play online with friends and treat the title closer to a PC game even. The first bit of bad news to really shake PSO was the Dreamcast version of PSO following the discontinuation and failure of the console itself would be shutting down August 28th, 2003. This would mark the first of many deaths for the ORPG which with its mini console versions was like a cat with multiple lives. The card game spin-off episode we mentioned would launch on GameCube in the US March 2nd, 2004, scoring a much lower score overall on Metacritic at 71. That being said, IGN would score the title an 8.5 being quite impressed with the presentation and overall lasting appeal of the online modes and tournaments. Episode 3 wasn't as positively received as the previous versions, and it will remain a bit of a dark spot on the franchise but it will also be remembered as a very unlikely but interesting spin-off title, and I think because of public perception at the time, it was a little bit unfairly maligned. Fantasy Star Online might have been by 2004 standards starting to slow its momentous rise to the top somewhat, but they didn't lose any shine in the meantime trying to capitalize on their momentum as much as possible. The Sonic team had no more platforms to launch on at the moment, but had their eyes set on the first platform they avoided from the jump, the PC. Fantasy Star Online Blue Burst, as it was dubbed and announced May 25th, 2004, was set to be the PC version of Episode 1 and 2. By June, Fantasy Star Online had opened up the floodgates for beta signups for Blue Burst. They would hit an impressive 100,000 signups, with 50,000 happening in just the first week alone. Fantasy Star Online Blue Burst would of course launch first in Japan, July 15th, 2004, but took some time to reach the West, launching in the US nearly a year later in June 2005. PSO Blue Burst would feature an entirely new story arc, 33 new additional quests, and a number of quality of life changes. There weren't many reviews done on the project unfortunately, but Blue Burst is the version of PSO that would go on to live the longest on the unofficial fan servers we will mention later. PSO Blue Burst, besides being even more dated in many ways, was still Fantasy Star Online at its best. Starting in April of 2007, a series of shutdowns would start to hit the ever successful, but now seven years old title. Starting in April of 2007, with the shutdown of Fantasy Star Online Episode 1 and 2 on the GameCube servers. Quite impressive for a console title, especially when the entertainment medium of video games was only growing more and more during this time, creating fierce competition. More server shutdowns would unfortunately hit the franchise. This time, their Xbox launch in Japan would be shut down, January 31st, 2008. This would be the last Japanese server shutting down, marking the end of Fantasy Star Online and its numerous console versions in the home country of its creation, Japan. The last servers to shut down for the online JRPG would not be the PC official servers, Fantasy Star Online Blue Burst, as they would unfortunately be shutting down those servers March 31st, 2008. Their fate, however, ultimately would have a better chance of surviving due to the community's support because of their location on the PC versus a dead console. In a totally random and probably coincidental way, the last PSO server to fall would be none other than my very first entry into the game itself the PSO Episode 1 and 2 release on Xbox in the US. The reason this version had more longevity was due to its ability to work on the next generation console at the time, Xbox 360. That's actually how I was able to play the title well into 2007 myself. April 22nd, 2008, however, was a sad day. This final server would shut down for good, marking the end of Fantasy Star Online's life on consoles. Sure, the game could be played offline, but unless you had people willing to system link or co-op, you would be ultimately missing out on the true experience of the game, which is meant to be played online with others. I would argue even then it would give an artificial game experience, even if you had friends to play with, as most of the fun of playing PSO was meeting people from all over the world, and that was magical. I'll miss the Xbox version, probably largely due to the nostalgia and experiences that shaped how I look at video games and my childhood to an extent. But the story of PSO doesn't end on a sad note. Like the protagonist of a freaking anime, the Fantasy Star Online franchise as a whole wouldn't end there. 
In fact, back in 2006, they actually launched an entirely new Fantasy Star spin-off that wasn't related to PSO in any way. Fantasy Star Universe was the title, and might be a video for another time, as it was a very short-lived title with an incredibly impactful legacy all the same. To shorten things up for this video though, PSU as it was dubbed, was PSO with more of an action combat focus and monster hunting slash looting focus. Less of the RPG parts of PSO. Fantasy Star Universe would score rather poor for this series though, scoring a 59 out of 100 on PC with a 68 out of 100 on PS2. But rather than these being outright bad games, I believe it's more so a product of the time and them seeming dated in 2006. PSU would go on to inspire the Monster Hunter series, which is impossible not to see the inspiration when you can find the very sparse footage of PSU located online, or have the lucky chance to play the lesser known online Fantasy Star title that is still revolutionizing the industry to an extent. Going back in the correct timeline direction again, PSO would launch a sequel title in Japan July 4th, 2012. However, calling the title a sequel felt odd when it didn't have many of the same original developers including Yuji Naka and Takao Miyoshi, who had both left the company following a less than stellar launch of Fantasy Star Universe back in 2006. Fantasy Star Online 2, like PSU and the PS franchise in general, also has an insanely interesting story, being that it never found its way to the West unlike the previous versions of the game until much later. And I mean, much later. Eight years. And then by the time it came out, it immediately was swapped out and traded for another version altogether, dubbed PSO2 New Genesis, featuring an entirely new combat rework, a large hub world zone, and many more changes. But this video is about PSO1, otherwise it would be like hours long, so let's save the PSO2 and New Genesis talk and discussion for another video altogether. Fast forward to 2015, and PSO was still being talked about as one of the most important games in console history. The 15 year long legacy of PSO was undeniable, so much so that it turns out that the legacy hadn't actually died yet. In fact, a Forbes article would hit the web March 9th, 2016, detailing the numerous existences of a PSO Blueburst private or community server that apparently had been in existence ever since the servers were shut down. Apparently, PSO hadn't died yet, and Blueburst, which I have to resist not saying blue balls, the PC version in particular, was still alive and kicking with hundreds of players playing the version on a number of different fan servers, such as Afinia, FantasyStarOnline.net, and PSO. There's far more examples, but those are probably the most popular servers. Fantasy Star Online is the first and one of the arguably most impactful online JRPGs ever, and it's still being played in 2021, 21 years later. We made it through the most memorable bits of Fantasy Star Online's now 21-year-old legacy, and have reached the end of the video, where we have our usual deduction concerning the reasons PSO was ultimately shut down. This deduction is going to be a little bit more of a formality, as it's not really detailing a failure of a game we're covering. This episode, as I stated from the very beginning, is about documenting the barely told pioneering history behind the first online JRPG on consoles, and what made the title and its legacy so impactful. Generally at this point, I felt we have done that, but I want to make one final point considering the legacy of PSO. Well, sort of two actually. The first being PSO wasn't designed as, and wasn't, an MMORPG, both by developer choice and design choice. That doesn't mean it will stop people from calling it that, but I wanted to make the distinction again, so we remember that part of why PSO was so impactful in the first place was because it wasn't an MMO, despite how many times IGN would repeatedly call it that, even though Yuji Naka kept telling them that it wasn't, by the way. And that's fairly common in the Western market, for people to just completely misrepresent or misunderstand what a product is supposed to be from the East. But PSO wasn't an MMO, and it was successful because it wasn't one. It didn't have auto-lock tab target combat, really, and it focused far more on the four-player cooperative experience versus some huge grand narrative or world experience with hundreds of players. Specifically, just like ArenaNet was able to do with Guild Wars, Sega with PSO was able to provide a near MMO-like experience to a generation of fans who didn't have access to MMOs or perhaps didn't have the time or interest to invest in them. PSO was one of the first and most impactful MMO-like or MMO-lite titles, but it was just an online JRPG, or an MORPG. Yuji Naka was an ultimate Diablo fan, who created Japan's answer to what was effectively the best ARPG franchise ever at the time, and did quite well for himself, I would say so. But you can see a bit of his vision when he spoke of the legacy of PSO in 2015. Yuji specifically targeted the Japanese developers Capcom and their mega-hit Monster Hunter, remarking about how without titles like PSO, 
there might not be titles like Monster Hunter. And I'm inclined to agree, and I think Monster Hunter devs would probably agree too. But Yuji didn't just impact the Monster Hunter franchise, or other ARPG-style titles. He took Asaokawa's vision of an online console gaming market in Japan and abroad, and had absolute faith in it, and its ability to affect the world, and put Japanese online RPGs on the map, period. Without this big step forward, it's arguable if Sony would have kept pursuing Final Fantasy XI, which launched shortly after PSO, or had the same level of success. And also, as most watching this video know, Final Fantasy XI led to the creation of the current, most dominant online RPG from Japan, Final Fantasy XIV. Sega with Akawa's vision and Yuji Naka's talent was able to effectively create an online RPG market whereas there otherwise literally wasn't one before. And now that same market is literally on top of the world. That makes the legacy Fantasy Star Online wrote in stone, as it continues to impact the most important Japanese online titles and more beyond till this day, and will always be remembered as the title that took the torch first for the East and Japan. Talk about poetic justice. I bet Okawa is quite thrilled with the news somewhere out or up there. Looking down, I hope from telling this story, Okawa's legacy and contributions can also be remembered. I mean, when the dude was on his deathbed, he realized that Sega wasn't doing so hot and forgave the debt that they owed him for funding the whole company. And we're not talking about a small loan of a million dollars, we're talking about over 40 million dollars. And that's just the cash that he gave them. He also gave up 695 million worth of stock options. Gave up as in refunded to Sega the company that he owned the stock in. Insanity. Okawa deserves to be up there on Mount Rushmore for online RPGs as the father of console online RPGs. You guessed it, that music playing and my voice running out means we've reached the deduction part of this video where we detail the largest contributing factors to the death of a game, Fantasy Star Online. Let's waste no more time and make haste. There's a case afoot. PSO was a console online RPG with multiple launches splitting population and hurting their longevity. PSO effectively created an industry that otherwise wasn't there before, which came with a heavy price of it being first into uncharted territory. PSO would launch numerous spin-offs and different versions, further splitting population and focus. The market shift from 2000 to 2006 alone is astronomical in terms of competition and overall technological capability. We've talked an awful lot about Legacy on today's episode, probably a lot more than usual, but I wanted to emphasize the importance of Fantasy Star Online as a franchise and the importance of highlighting such. The Death of a Game series isn't a review, and isn't a series meant to hate or bash titles. It's a post-mortem series that handles dead or dying games, but every now and then, we cover something that didn't just abruptly fail or die, and it's important that we distinguish the difference between these two types of games or projects out of respect for a game that made up a large part of my childhood, but also for a title that helped push the entire industry forward. I hope after watching this video, you have gotten just a little bit more appreciation for one of my favorite games ever, Fantasy Star Online. Meanwhile, in 2021, knock us off making Balan wonder what- wait, wait, no, no, Yuji. No, but seriously, thanks for watching, guys. It's all just a fading memory now. Life used to be easy.